I'm Molly. I'm a PhD student studying the genetics and evolution of columbine flowers in the Kramer Lab at Harvard. So right now it's springtime in Cambridge and the flowers are blooming everywhere and their petals come in every shape, size, and color imaginable. But many of the petals you'll see this spring have something in common, and that's that they're relatively flat and two-dimensional organs. They're thinner than a piece of paper. Much of what scientists know about the genes controlling petal development come from studying species that make these relatively simple petals. Columbine flowers, on the other hand, make 3D petals. They form this complex, elongated structure called a spur, which secretes nectar as a reward for pollinators. One of the big questions in our lab is, how did these unusual petals evolve? Do columbines use the same genes to make their 3D petals that other flowers use to make 2D petals, or are they doing something entirely different? The story gets even crazier. There are around 70 species of columbines, and their nectar spurs come in different shapes and sizes depending on what pollinates a given species. Bee pollinated species have nectar spurs that are short and curved, while hummingbird pollinated species spurs are long and straight to accommodate the hummingbird's beak. Hawk moths have even longer tongues, so the spurs of columbine species that they pollinate can reach up to 16 centimeters long. Columbines evolved all of this spur diversity in a couple million years, which I know sounds like a really long time, but it's really fast evolutionarily speaking. For my dissertation, I'm trying to figure out what genes are responsible for these different spur shapes and what role they played in the evolution of columbine flowers. Answering these questions involves doing a ton of fun things in the lab and being surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of beautiful flowers all day. It's the best job ever. My hunt for spur-shaped genes has taken me all over the scientific map. I've done classical botanical studies like counting and measuring cells in the growing petals to understand how these different spur shapes develop, sliced spurs in half and sequence their RNA to see if the inside and outside of the curve are expressing different genes. Spoiler alert, they are collaborated with applied mathematicians to develop a technique to quantify spur curvature, and sequenced the genomes of 400 columbine plants looking for correlations between their DNA sequences and their spur shape. And I've actually found a few promising candidate genes that might be controlling spur shape. I just can't tell you about them quite yet because I need to do some more work to verify my hypotheses. I need to do a bunch of in situ hybridizations, an experiment that will show me where my gene is being expressed in a flower bud. I start off by making microscope slides of the flower buds, which will reveal all of the baby developing petals. First, I embed a flower bud in a block of wax, then make super thin slices of it, and put the slices on a microscope slide. The in situ hybridization will turn the flower bud purple only where my gene is being expressed. So this is a flower bud after the experiment is finished. You can see all the baby flower organs, sepals, a petal starting to make a spur, stamens with anthers full of pollen, and carpels. So we can see that the spur is purple. This means my gene is being expressed in the petal. Looking more carefully, I can see the purple is mostly on the sides of the spur. So that's a good sanity check that it could be involved in controlling spur shape, right? The gene is on in the place that spur shape is happening. It's expressed in the carpels too, but that's okay. Genes can have multiple jobs, so it might be important for carpal development as well. So this is a good start, but I need to do more in situ hybridizations in different species as well as in younger and older flower buds to understand how this gene expression pattern changes throughout development and between different spur shapes. I'm also figuring out the gene's function by creating mutant columbines that are missing the gene and seeing how that affects their spur shape. So maybe by turning this gene off, some curved spurs will become straight or something crazy like that. My lab has created some super cool mutants over the years of studying columbine genetics, and I can't wait to add mine to the mix. I did the mutation experiment a few months ago, and now I'm just waiting for my flowers to bloom so I can see if they have any wild and weird spur shapes. Science has taken me on so many adventures outside of the lab too. I've traveled more in grad school than I have in my entire life before. To Hawaii and the south of France for conferences, to the Canadian Rockies to collect columbine flowers, to the Kachinga biome of Brazil to learn about endemic plant families, and to California to sequence all of those columbine genomes with our collaborators. So I often get asked about the practical applications of my research, and it is definitely super fun to imagine that someone might one day take my work on petal shape and use it to solve problems in agriculture or pollinator conservation, um, but 
as a discovery scientist, that isn't actually what gets me out of bed in the morning. I'm studying an organism that is unique in its biological story and I get to uncover its secrets. As far as we know, humans are the only species in the universe capable of scientific discovery, so I really think of it as our special privilege and duty to study and describe all of the wild and wonderful phenomena of the natural world. I'm so lucky to have an advisor who is a champion for women in STEM and who has been super supportive not only of my science but my outreach adventures as well. My YouTube channel Science in Real Life would not be what it is today without her. She supported everything from me attending SciComm workshops to helping me apply for grants that have funded even more travel around the country to make episodes about amazing women plant biologists. All I can say is that the last five years have been a wild ride and I can't wait to share the final results with you all once I finish my PhD, which will happen at some point. Well, many thanks to Dave for letting me wax poetic about columbines for the last few minutes. And I really hope I'll see some of you over at Science in Real Life. Bye.